Today I'd like to take a look at the LAB color mode. It's considered one of the most powerful color modes in Photoshop, and it operates differently than RGB or CMYK, in that the LAB, it's not really considered lab, although I think colloquially people will just call it lab mode. Uh, it's really just a designation of lightness, and then the A channel, and the B channel. So instead of red, green, and blue, or CMYK of our channels, it's actually separated the color out into the A and B channel, and separated the luminosity, the lightness, brightness, contrast, into the lightness channel, so that we can control luminosity separately from we can control color. In scenarios where I may have a really tough color correction situation, and I don't want to affect the luminosity of the file, just the color, uh, this would be something that I could use and take a look at. We can also use the LAB mode in custom mask creation, which I'll show you in the second segment here. First, let's take a look at some of these color spaces. Here is a sort of 3D rendition of generally the Adobe 98 color space, a really popular color space out there. When we compare that to, say, what happens when you take an Adobe 98 file and you convert it to CMYK, to four color printing, you can see that there's a lot of information that gets lost. You know, what we had before, this large saturated color space, and we dump it into four colors, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, and a lot of the information gets dumped out of there. So you have to convert and make some adjustments when you go into CMYK. Conversely, with the LAB mode, it's a different animal in that it is, in this illustration, it's this big sort of blocky thing. It is the largest of the color spaces. Uh, some would argue it's so large that it's almost not even a color space because our computers do not have the ability to even render some of the color and tone that's in the LAB space. It's outside of the realm of what we see here. There's even a book about the LAB color mode written by, by a digital prepress guru by the name of Dan Margulis. And, you know, it's about that thick. If you want to read all about this color mode in specific, that would be sort of the Bible for that. So there you have, you know, basically sort of a visual representation of the LAB color mode, which is really this enormous color space. And, you know, we have small color spaces, four ink color spaces, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, or the saturated uh, color spaces like Adobe 98 or Profoto RGB. Now let's take a look at ways we can color correct with the LAB mode and kind of how this particular mode works. So I have this RGB file of these three KitchenAid mixers, for example. If I were to come up here to the image menu mode and convert from RGB to LAB, uh, now I'm in the LAB color space. Now one thing to remember is that when you convert from RGB to CMYK, you're taking a lot of saturated color and you're shrinking it down to four colors. Uh, and you're going to lose some information. And it's, by its very nature, somewhat destructive. If you have to go to CMYK, it's a necessary part of the process. Um, holding on to your original RGB photographs is a great idea. If you're moving a file from RGB to LAB mode, however, it's such a large color space that nothing really gets lost. It's nothing that you could really worry about. I could convert this file to LAB and back to RGB, back and forth and back and forth, 50 times, and print the image and it would look no different. Um, it's, it's that powerful. So let's take a look at how this operates when using a curve adjustment. I bring up my curve adjustments here. And the LAB mode operates on a 0 to 100 scale. The lightness channel, you can see here, is just the luminosity of the file. And then we have the A channel. And what the A channel represents is you can think of it in terms of the numbers, positive and negative. Positive would be warm colors and the negative would be cool colors. The A channel represents the magenta and green information in the file. And the B channel represents the blue and the yellow. So, you know, on the positive end in the A channel, we'd be looking at positive numbers in the info panel and it would rep represent magenta. And in the B, the positive numbers would represent yellow. Um, and the negatives in the A channel would be green, in the B it would be blue. So that's how it separated this color out. You can see here, if I bring up my info pa panel here and I bring my eyedropper into the scene onto this, this green KitchenAid mixer, it gives me a lightness value from 0 to 100 of 65. And it tells me that in the A channel, which is where my magenta and green information lives, that we're looking at negative 26. That 
seems about right. We would expect that and something that's cool colored like green. Um, and then as far as color goes in the B channel where the blue and the yellow reside, there is more yellow in this than there would be blue in this particular spot of this green KitchenAid mixer. So if I was looking to say, make a color change of this particular green KitchenAid mixer, but you'll see that you know it's a fairly complicated selection to have to make. I would have to select all the way around the item. I would have to subtract from the selection the, um, the, the mixing pot here. I would have to add into the selection all the areas where the green reflection is, subtract from the selections, uh, all of the you know chrome banding and hardware. And then there's also the green reflection that's happening in this other, the other mixer's reflections. So, there are some considerations. In some cases, when I look at an image like this and I need to make a color change like that, like they want to take this kitchen, green KitchenAid mixer, and make a version where they have it more of an orange red color, I would take a look at this and I would sort of in my mind calculate how much time it's going to take me to make a selection of all that information. And then I might first look if, to see if I could quickly get at this in the LAB mode before taking the time to make those selections. The first thing I need to do is I need to target that information. Since I'm looking to change the green, I would go to the A channel. Now, it's a little bit of an interesting animal in that the center point right here in this indicates the neutral point of the file. As I bring this anchor point up, it begins to introduce magenta, and as I bring it down, it will want to try to introduce green. So in order to prevent from any color shifts from happening globally to the whole image, I need to drop an anchor point that I won't move on the center point. And it can be kind of tricky to try to get it perfectly there. You can see down below where it says input negative one, output negative two. Often what I do is I just drop a point, and then I will use my arrow keys on the keyboard to get my input and output on the zero. And that way I know that I'm right on that center point. I, I come into the scene here and I grab my scrubby finger and I look in here to where there's some, some green and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna drop an anchor point there. The first move that I'm gonna make is gonna have a negative effect on the yellow and the blue mixer. I'm not gonna worry too much about that. I just want to kind of first dial in generally where my color is gonna go with, with this green, and then I'll, I'll go after the blue and the yellow after. What I need to do is I need to take that green, which is down here. It's kind of below this horizontal line, indicating here's our positive information where things are gonna go magenta, and down here is where our cool information is, where things would go green. And I need to drag this point where I've said sampled right out of this green mixer and drag it straight up. And I'm looking to make that mixer more of an orange. You can see it also changed the color of the other mixer. This mixer here has now gone purple. This one's starting to go green. I'm gonna come over and you can see that because of the curvature of this line, it's thrown this side of my curve downward. And what I need to do is I need to grab it and drag this point back up and what I do is I get this line about right in there and I use my arrows to bring this anchor point down as close to that center anchor point as I can. There we go, something like that. And I'm gonna take a look at this yellow over here. Usually I'll take the visibility eyeball on and off and see what detrimental. So the yellow is looking pretty good. I need to just get my, my blue mixer looking better. So I'm still anchored there. So I'm looking to kind of dial in where this mixer's information lives so that I can make some changes there. I don't want it to be quite so purple, but more back to that original blue. It's looking pretty close. So just manipulating some of these points, we're able to make these color adjustments. That's looking pretty good. And because my curve here is getting crushed to the top, I don't want that to happen. So I'm gonna dial that back a bit, right about in there. Little other things that I would probably look at would I would probably come in here and I'd zoom in on this color. And I'd notice that some, there's some, you know, artifacting, some anomalies that are happening in the, in the highlights here. And in which case I would come and I would grab my little scrubby finger and I would go and look around and see if I can target some of that information, try to identify where that is happening. 
and I would start dragging that curve around to see, you know, what is the, the threshold? What is pushing it too far? And I start to dial that back down and you can see that making that little move, I took it from having this sort of solarized little look where it was catching some green in that information and I was able to control for that as well. You can see that it's had an effect on my, my blue mixer and so I, again I want to come back and I want to take a look at that information. So it's sort of this you know delicate dance between working with these two colors and making sure that in this case some of that solarization is coming from this part of the curve coming up so high. So I'm dragging that back down. And there we go. There will be a very quick and dirty way of making some color changes to an object without having to make any complicated selections by using the image mode, LAB mode, and dropping an anchor point you can see dead center. You can see our curve ends up looking pretty wild and a lot of it is using the scrubby finger, identifying where in this curve those points live, making the first change to the item that you want to change color to, in this case this middle KitchenAid mixer, and then going after other areas that might have been affected by that initial move and dialing those back down. It's a powerful tool. It doesn't work on every image, but it works on many. And it can sometimes be the first step that you make to get something quick like this before getting into real complicated selections if that's what's not really needed. You know, an image like this, if it's going to web, it's probably going to end up being not very big, um, so potentially not as critical. If it was going to print, if, if those scenarios, I'd be looking at making some complicated selections. And even if I were to be making some selections to begin with, you know, take the time to have this whole thing selected out, I can still use the LAB mode and utilize the curve adjustment layer and load that curve as a mask so that it's only then being applied to this middle kitchen aid mixer and not having any negative effect on any of the other ones at all. In this instance you can see the power though of being able to target just a s one part of the image just in this curve dialog, something you are not able to do with the RGB mode or the CMYK mode. Now let's take a look at this next use of the LAB mode. There are times when as a Photoshop artist you need to make a selection of something that's complicated. And in this case, you know, if I wanted to make a selection and change the color, this particular client, let's say, has a number of these shirts and they want to have a number of them printed where instead of it being orange, there might be a purple one, there might be a blue one, some different colors instead of the orange. In production, often what we'll do is we'll photograph it once and then we'll take it into Photoshop, duplicate the file a number of times, and then change the colors. And in this scenario, if I wanted to make a selection of that area to change that color, I could sure try with something like, uh, you know, select color range. Let's give it a shot. You know, maybe I could use the magic wand and you can see that the magic wand is going to give me a selection. It's missing some little bits. It's n not catching, you know, areas around this fella here. It's missing areas. So I'd have to spend some time adding to that selection to get it right. Um, I could attempt something like select color range and I come here and click on the orange once and again and cruise around looking to get a selection like so. And you can see it does a pretty good job. There's some areas in here that are being missed, little bits that would be missing, little areas that's kind of chunky. Um, it does an okay job, but I'd still have to finesse that. You can see, you know, little spots that are missing. So let's take a look if, you know, we were to take this file and try to make a channel mask of it. I could look at the different color channels. So here's, you know, the red channel. Let's zoom in and take a closer look at the tone. There isn't a lot of separation here between this orange that I'm after and the logo, the Pete's logo here. So that would be difficult. In the green, there isn't a whole lot of contrast difference between this tone and say the apron. So if I were to go to try to separate those, it would be difficult then I would be taking the apron with me. Um, and then I can look at the blue and the blue is even closer to, you know, the blue is closest to the barista here. So that would be kind of a difficult one to work with. So in some cases, what I'll, I'll do at this stage is I'm going to duplicate the file. Image, duplicate. 
and I'm going to call this one CMYK. And this is, in my process, that's the next step. I would take the image to CMYK, this dupe. Not really, really worrying about converting this color because I'm taking the image and making a duplicate. I'm not affecting the original image. And it gives me the ability to now come and examine the cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So you can see, see with cyan, the orange, and the border too close, the logo, I wouldn't be able to separate those. Um, this one's pretty good, but again, I'm going to have a hard time separating this orange from the barista and yellow. It's okay. It's getting a little funky down in here. That might be tricky. And black, forget about it. It just blends right in with the, uh, the white logo here. Okay, so CMYK is not going to work out for me. So I'm going to go ahead and close that file. Don't save. And I'm going to duplicate this original one again. Image duplicate. And I'm going to call it LAB. And here we have an LAB file. Now I can take a look at image mode lab and i take a look at the a channel oh that's pretty nice right off the bat or the b that's pretty nice too i mean look that's like a it's like a mask right off the bat so if i take this a and i bring it down to the dog-eared page and i copy it and i bring up my levels dialog and drag this black slider over and I can grab my white eyedropper and click in this area, drag my, grab my black eyedropper, click in here, boom, I've got a really good mask right off the bat. I would probably still zoom in on this to take a closer look, just to make sure, and crush my whites over even more to the left, and do the same with the black, push that over to the right to really just push that off, click OK. And I have a nice mask, which is great because I can drag it from this LAB holding shift over here to my RGB file, which allows me when I control or command on the Mac, click this icon in the channels palette. It loads it as a selection, allowing me to then come to something like hue and saturation and apply some other mask and change the color as needed on the fly if they have a number of different product like this but they have a different you know colors of them photograph it once duplicate the file a number of times in this case i'm using the lab mode to create a custom mask and then pick it up drag it over to my original file and make the color change utilizing an adjustment layer with a layer mask on it so those are some of the various uses of the lab mode a couple of ones that come up very frequently anyhow if you liked this video, hit the thumbs up sign. If you didn't like the video, hit the thumbs down. If you'd like to leave a comment, leave a comment down below. If you'd like to receive more of this great content, hit the subscribe button up there or down there. You can hit the little bell. It'll indicate and tell you when new videos are uploaded. And thank you very much to Canon for providing the video camera for this. Thanks for watching.